Local support for Charlie Rose is made possible in part by a grant from Mirage Resorts Incorporated, developers of the Golden Nugget, Mirage, and Treasure Island in Las Vegas, and the Golden Nugget in Laughlin. Charlie Rose is made possible by a grant from USA Networks as part of our continuing commitment to innovative television. Through USA Network and the Sci-Fi Channel, we provide original entertainment to America and the world. Charlie Rose is also made possible by these funders. From the studios of KLVX in Las Vegas, this is Charlie Rose. Welcome to the broadcast. Tonight, the story of a city, Las Vegas, of a business, gaming, and of a man, Steve Wynn. His company is Mirage Resorts. Fortune magazine canvassed hundreds of CEOs, and it chose it the second most admired company in America, second to Coca-Cola. Steve Wynn's father was in the bingo business. He died at 46, and Steve Wynn, just out of the University of Pennsylvania, set aside his plans and took over the business in order to pay off his father's debts. Two months later, he married Elaine Pascal, who today sits on the board of the Mirage and is her husband's closest confidant. Wynn made his first million by 30, and 31 was CEO of the Golden Nugget. His empire expanded to include Mirage, Treasure Island, and soon to open Palagio. I should note in the interest of full disclosure that Steve is my friend, and because of his interest in art, he underwrote a special I did on Cezanne. I'm in Las Vegas to moderate a dialogue with Jesse Jackson and Jack Kemp, so it seemed an appropriate time to sit down at KLVX Channel 10 with this city's most prominent citizen, and I am very pleased to welcome him again to this program. Welcome, sir, in your city. Nice to have you here, Charlie. Man, it's great to be here. Uh, it has changed since I was it's, last here. It's a lot here. different, isn't it, to see it now? It has also yeah. changed since you were here in 1953. You're 11 years old. You come here with your father. Tell me about that experience. You know, the, the, the hotels were, there were eight of them or nine of them, and there was just desert in between and everybody wore cowboy boots and cowboy clothes and rode horses. And it was a cowboy place with a, spa with a strange kind of exotic energy. There were all those unmentionable characters, you know, that you read about, the Kefauver Committee talked about yeah. it. And I think people came to Las Vegas as much to see the characters as they did to gamble or to see the shows. The place itself was a spectacle. And very, very overwhelming one, too. I mean, you know, the, 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 the action, the, the excitement, the people staying up all night. It infected my father. He was greatly, greatly influenced by it. He thought this was the most fabulous place in the world. Naturally, I want to talk about Mike Lynn a little bit later, but did you leave that 11 years old thinking, man, this is a great place. Maybe I'll come back here someday? I was here for two weeks. <laughs> my father was here for three. Yeah. And at the time, I had the notion this must be, again, you know, a kid does everything because of his father. My father was completely enthralled by this place. And so I saw the place through his eyes, and his enthusiasm and his fascination with it affected me. So I took on those notions that this was the most <laughs> fabulous place, and uh, I, had a, I had a very romantic version of Las Vegas. All right, now you sit here, and there is the Mirage Resorts Incorporated. Uh, there is the Bellagio, 3,005 rooms opening soon. Yeah. There is Biloxi. There is Atlantic City, three new hotels with lots of room. A huge investment by you, over a billion dollars to build these, these hotels. Okay, that'll be over 2.7 billion. Does this say that you believe that gaming is a business for the future? That <laughs> you believe that... <laughs> if it doesn't, it's, 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 if it doesn't, <laughs> if it you're doesn't, a stockholder. We're going to meet a bunch of new lawyers <laughs> and get yelled at. I, I've had this maybe naive notion that if you did a job well enough when it came to the business, again, my experience has been molded here in Las Vegas, but that if you built a place that appealed to a broadest range of people, if you did it well enough, if you, if you had a, a rudimentary, fundamental understanding of who those people were that were coming to Las Vegas, why they were coming, and God knows that was no secret. It was just a big party, a place for color and excitement and a, and, and, a, and a tempo that you couldn't get anywhere else. That if you gave people a better version of that, 
that the same energy would infect them that infected my father and I 45 years ago. Every time that we've tried something in our company's history, and I've been on a job now 25 years, every time we've tried something fanciful or wacky or outlandish, if we've done it well, if we've sort of kept the faith, if we've hold, held the line, we've never been disappointed. We've had no failures. So the company grew, got better and better, got more and more employees, made more money, got a better credit rating, which allowed it to take on bigger projects like the ones you described a second ago. And I still got the feeling that if we do it well enough. Uh, another thing that's happened, we, we, like the three little pigs, built these houses of brick. We spent more money than other people had spent to do things that other people hadn't done at the time. Not that we were so blazingly original. Everything is sort of springing off what happened before us. We were inspired by other buildings and other hotels and other places. But the fact of the matter is, every time we did something well, we were rewarded. We've never had a failure. I have, along with my colleagues, the men and women of the company, we've become accustomed to this pursuit of excellence, and we most importantly, we've learned to trust it. All right, let me talk about the city and come back to you. What is Las Vegas today in your mind? You've seen this evolution. There was a lot of talk about family, a lot of talk about people coming here. There was some talk for a while about children coming here. You've got volcanoes, and you've got parrots' boats sinking, and you've got all this stuff here. What is it? A lot it? of stuff. What's going on in terms of the mindset of this place out here? There is no monolithic answer to that question. There's, there's a lot of things going on out here at the same time. And if you drive down the strip like you and Elaine and I did to come to, the, uh, to Channel 10 to do the show, you see it all at once. And it's, it, it, you know, it's a bit much. The fact of the matter is that place by place, company by company, there's quite a, there's quite a diversity of attitude and opinion on what's going on. But what is it, a final destination for entertainment? Is yes. that it? It's the place where folks are coming from, from every culture, regardless of their economic their, or their cultural background, whether they're from Asia, Latin America, North America, Europe, whether they're middle class, upper middle class, very rich, or normal folks, blue collar workers. They're journeying to Las Vegas because this is a city without, at least, if it's an original, Charlie, it's an original, it's a, it's a town without a speck of hypocrisy. All right, now, Las, here, it's here, blatantly Las Vegas, a party that doesn't stop. It's like a flasher, it's like a woman. You know, those, remember those, in the 670s, they flash. There's no subtlety. All right, but here I you and I going. tonight went to your hotel, and we didn't go see the volcano and all of the sort of the glitz and all of the thrill a minute. We no. went to see Picasso. Matisse. Jean. Matisse. Monet. Monet. You are out spending money to buy quality, the best art that yep. you can find. You're passionate about this. What does it have to do with Las that Vegas and your vision of the place? Good question. And the answer remains to be seen. History will be the judge of that. But what I'm trying to do, and I say this with humor, I'm trying to get past Don King, <laughs> who's my friend, and we've had those fights all these years at the Mirage and done really well with them, and they're a great part of our, our scene here in Las Vegas. But I'm, I'm trying to broaden the appeal of Las Vegas to a wider group of adults so that people who don't think of coming here will now think of coming. And I think of the relationship, and these are things that are both, that are important to both of us. The relationship of fine arts to the psyche of the, wor the citizens of the world today. And I'm beginning, I'm convinced that this is not an effete, esoteric, you know, affected kind of interesting thing for the very few who are dilettantes that go to museums. I think that fine arts have a powerful bedrock kind of appeal. Elaine and I went to a show last year in Chicago at the Fine Arts Center of Degas, the Impressionist artist Degas. And you couldn't get near the building in, and the show was extended for weeks and weeks and weeks. And they were charging like 15 bucks to get in. Every time there's a big show at a major city of Picasso or Matisse or, or Degas or Renoir or someone like that, everybody shows up. We are living in a time when people are beginning to ask different questions. Maybe it's because all of the 
complexity of urban life is rolling over all of us. But I'm hoping that the fine arts at the, at the Mirage and at Bellagio, which is really what spur, which sparked this, I'm hoping that it's going to, uh, it's going to awaken another, you know, another sort of spot in people. You know, say, hey, let's go. I hear the place is special. They've actually got all these great paintings on display, free in the lobby. And maybe people are going to get a different idea of, if not Las Vegas, at least of our property. And what happens if somebody says, Steve, this is great. You know, you've got these wonderful paintings and you've shown great taste in which what you've bought and you have taken the time to study and to learn and understand each of these paintings, but putting them in a casino, Picasso in a casino. You know, in that regard, I had a moment of, of real <laughs> judgment crisis. I, I was offered the opportunity to buy a magnificent Rembrandt that was a scene of St. Peter in prison. And then this wonderful picture, this tormented man is there with a light shining through the top of the cell. Obviously, it's right after he betrayed Jesus. And you could see all in the great detail of Rembrandt, you could see all the pain and suffering and guilt in his face. The, the painting was to die from. I mean, you didn't have to love art. You, you're in the company of this painting. Your eyes, I mean, you, you just stared at it transfixed. And I wanted to buy the painting so much to have a Rembrandt in Las Vegas, but the subject matter frightened me a little bit. Now, you, you asked this question in relation to someone like Pablo Picasso. Now, Picasso is a lusty Spaniard. That's right. He belongs in Las Vegas. You know, it's okay. <laughs> I'm not afraid time. of it. You know, I, I, if, if, if anything, you know, someone say I may overshoot the mark. I've never been disappointed by counting on the good taste of the public. It's not true that everybody sees everything the first second. But when people walk into a beautiful place, they say, oh, this is for me. And they get a good feeling. They know that whoever is responsible for it has a good opinion of them. Has it changed you in any way? Here you are at my age, at 55, eminently successful. You've got um, most things that anybody could hope to have. And looking forward to keeping them, too, <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> but has this sort of involvement has it changed you at all? Has it added anything to your life? All of a sudden, you not only to look at the paintings, but you study the artist, you understand the context of the painting, you've taken your time to know more. I studied, I took a couple of courses in art history at the University of Pennsylvania in 1960 or 61, and I thought how wonderful it was looking at those pictures, never dreaming that I would have a chance to do so in such intimacy as we are talking about tonight. And I thought it must be a wonderful thing to collect art, to, to, to actually to be responsible and have possession of such things, if not ownership, at least for a while, to hold them. I never realized how good it was really going to be. And frankly, you know, I go twice a day to see the paintings, and it's good for my soul. But you know, everybody else at the hotel, where we keep them at the Mirage, the security guards, the dealers in the, in the particular area where we're keeping them temporarily, the maintenance guys that work on the lighting, Every one of them are now into Monet and Renoir and Picasso and Matisse and Modigliani. I am, I am totally stunned by the, the, the wide-ranging, strong response of everybody, not just myself. It's much better than I ever thought, much better. The, my life and the life of my family and friends has been overwhelmingly enriched by having the proximity to these paintings, which I'm... I'm hoping it's going to rub off on everybody else, too. And you don't know how far it'll go. You don't know how many you'll collect. You're just, as long as your appetite is there, as long as you have the resources, and as long as you have a place, and as long as Why not? you find something you like. Why not? Why not? As long as, long as, it's, as the company is doing well, as long as it suits the public. Look, putting dolphins to the back of the Mirage wasn't exactly what you call a hardcore <laughs> P&L kind of thing to do. I mean, the bean counters, if I was ever subject to the review and the control of an accountant. That's probably one of the great advantages of being a stockholder in the company as well as a CEO. If I had ever been under the control of some of the MBAs and accountants that have taken over Las Vegas in the modern era, we wouldn't have dolphins, we wouldn't have white tigers all over the place, let alone art. Let's talk about the things that made you have the attitude you did about risk, about taking chances, about an appreciation, about doing things, and talk about five or six people that have influenced your life. Mike Wynn, your father. 
Elaine, your wife, Harry Thomas, your original banker and friend, Michael Milken, who have financed some important uh, moves that you've made in building this empire. First, Mike Wynn, your dad. Tell me what, tell me about him. My father was a insouciant, enthusiastic and lovable man who wore his heart on his sleeve and had nothing but goodwill. Everybody that knew him loved him. He was a man-child. He was a boy. When I went to school with Penny, they, they thought he was a freshman. He wore a crew cut. He was <laughs> slim and, and youthful, and he had an attitude that was like a kid that never had grown up. He was very good at his business, promoting bingo games and getting lots of people to come because he loved his customers. He had a gambling problem, which was an interesting thing, which was a, a, an interesting part of my youth. But my father was a man who believed that in life, don't be worried about what you think of everybody else. Worry about what they think of you. And being a success in life wasn't easy. And when a man or a woman had achieved success, they were worthy of respect. And if everybody could do it, everybody would, but they can't. So my dad was a guy who was very respectful of other people and of his customers, the people, the ladies that came to play bingo in his bingo hall, and, and of all people that were very successful in life. My dad had a great sense of respect for others. And, uh, and if he was hard on anybody in life, it was himself. It was a great, great pal of mine. And he had surgery. From yeah, he died on the table. He, had, he was one of those unfortunate people that had uh, rheumatic fever as a child. That left him with a damaged aortic valve, and that led to heart failure in his early 40s, and finally got to the point where if he didn't have the surgery, he probably wouldn't have lived a month. So they did a very avant-garde surgery in those days, what Arnold Schwarzenegger just did. They replaced his aortic valve, but there had been too much damage to his heart, and he never got off that heart-lung machine. And I, my mother and I, my mother Zell and I, we got to have one of those experiences where you sit in the waiting room and the doctors walk in with the masks down and say, I'm sorry. And my world collapsed when that day happened. I think probably one of the things that's helped me in life was that when you're, when, 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 when you're a young man and, and your world revolves around your father and he's everything to you, and you lose a person like that, it's such a devastating event that you can say, well, nothing, this is the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. Nothing, nothing worse than this could have ever happened. And when that worst thing happens, well, hell, the rest of the things that can happen to you don't seem so awful after that. So I've never been as afraid of anything as I was of losing my father as a kid. So would you love for him to be able to see it today? Oh, I would give, except for the security of the kids in the lane, I'd give it all for an hour with my old man in the Mirage walking on one of those corporate planes we fly our customers <laughs> around in. My father, <laughs> oh, what a moment that would be. Gosh, oh. My mother and I, and Elaine and I, we talk about it all the time. You know, my, 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 my children never met their grandfather. And that would have been a great thing. But look, you were my mother's here. She's alive and well, thank goodness. She in Las Vegas? Yep. Uh, your dad dies unexpectedly on the operating table. You're at the University of Pennsylvania. Two months from graduation. Two months from graduation, you're 21 years old, mm -hmm. 1963. He leaves the bingo games, and he's in debt. Whatever yeah. plans you have change. I was going to go to law school. Boy, I'll tell you, the world got saved from that. <laughs> I didn't go, end up being a lawyer, but uh, I was going to go to law school. I did for a semester go to the University of, uh, I went to Georgetown Law School, which was right there where the bingo was in Washington. But Elaine and I got married as we had planned to do, my father had, had helped us plan the wedding. In fact, she was the daughter of a friend of your father. That's how we met. They played gin together. They were both gamblers. <laughs> My father and, and Elaine's dad, a guy named Sonny Pasco, were both degenerate gamblers. If they got around any form of gaming, and it didn't have to be legal. I mean, they gambled on sports with a bookmaker, or they gambled at cards with each other and other guys. You know, they were just fellows that loved to be in action. Picking up the business story. So you rescue the business, you pay off the debts, you yeah. come to Las Vegas, the Frontier Hotel, you buy 3% of it, or about that, yes? And all of a sudden you arrive at Las Vegas and you find out that there's a problem with the Frontier Hotel. The guys who own it, some of them, some of them. Suspected of having links to organized crime. Suspected of having links to organized crime, and you say, I, I can't be here. Well, the, 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 this all surfaces when the place opens. And, and it all takes about 60 days the investigation surfaces that 
a judge from Detroit and a fellow that owned a paving company maybe fronting for Detroit hoodlums. And at the same time, Howard Hughes is living across the street in a Desert Inn hotel and decides that he's afraid a sign's gonna fall on his head or something. He's gotta own the frontier. And he dispatches his Mormon banker, Edward Perry Thomas, to buy up the sands and the frontier and the silver slipper and everything else. And between the disclosure of the investigation and the publicity that followed, myself and some of the other shareholders were dying to find the exit. Hughes's arrival was very fortuitous. And we pushed for the sale, and it took from the hotel opened in July. We found out about the uh, connection in August. We started negotiating to sell the hotel, and we concluded the transaction in November. So the career at the frontier, because of these factors, lasted for four months. But Harry Thomas becomes a friend. He's a Mormon, yes. he's a banker, he knows Howard Hughes. I want to go home to Maryland. Uh -huh. And he says, you ought to stick around. He says, this town has just begun. Now, at the time, Las Vegas had boomed during these 60s. Yeah. Because of Hughes? Uh, uh, Hughes and other things. There had been a lot of stuff going on. It had gotten steadily bigger during the 50s and 60s. People that lived here talked about the good old days when land was cheap. They had thought, they thought that it was over, see? At, at every season, this town has confounded the prognosticators. Everybody's thought that, well, it can't last any longer. The, 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 the simple days are behind us. This is saturation mode. And it can't take one more hotel, Not and one it does. More. Yeah. And Perry Thomas said, no, it hasn't even started. And he gives you a liquor license, or you become a liquor wholesaler. I buy, I buy a distributorship. You buy a distributorship, but it puts you within the people who are in power. In I was banging on the back door as a purveyor in Reno and Las Vegas, selling liquor, wine, and beer. Did you meet ever Hughes? No. no. And you know, every time I denied that, people would say, sure, were you expecting to admit it? <laughs> well, we sold him the hotel, and then I bought this piece of property while I was a liquor distributor next to Caesar's it's Palace. It's so, it's a parking lot. It was a parking lot. A little tiny, skinny piece of property, 160 feet wide. Now, why would Hughes, who had a reputation for never selling real estate, sell to you? I don't want to extend this, but I'll tell you that it was a combination of being on my toes, I knew something, and luck. Howard Hughes' affairs had been run by a, a former FBI agent named Robert Mayhew. Mayhew had taken over at the request of Hughes and tossed out the old Hughes guard of Mormons and other people from Los Angeles. They resented that. They, but this fellow Mayhew had the ear of Hughes. It took a while, but the old guard ousted Mayhew. Now, Bob Mayhew still lives here. And there were a lot of internecine wars going on, but finally, the old guard ousted Mayhew and whisked Howard Hughes out of Las Vegas to the Bahamas. Right. This all happened with blitzkrieg speed. Hughes is in the Bahamas, Mayhew is out, and the old group is back in, a guy named Bill Gay. And that following week, I make a suggestion to Perry Thomas that I'd like to talk to the real estate guy for Howard Hughes, who was, had been with him for 23 years, who had been out of favor, now was back in charge, a guy named Herb Nall, wonderful man. I'd like to talk to him about that skinny piece of property they own next to Caesars. Which is a parking lot. Right. What I did know that made the transaction work is Hughes owned the Landmark Hotel and was paying rent on the parking lot to a third party. Shows you how Quint's life works. The guy's name was Cliff Jones. He was a former lieutenant governor. He owned a parking lot, was getting $10,000 a month from Hughes at the Landmark. Hughes was getting $1,000 a month for a parking lot from Caesars Palace on the Strip. Both pieces of property were useless. I had once looked at the Landmark, and I knew that Hughes had an option, as the, as the tenant, to buy the parking lot from Cliff Jones for a million dollars, and thereby saving $120,000 a year. That is to say, 12% on his money. He was only getting a thousand a month or twelve thousand at the other parking lot. I said to Herb Nall, why don't you let me give you a million dollars? You're only getting twelve grand from Caesars a year. You'll save the rent of a hundred and twenty thousand and use this money to buy the landmark parking lot. Herb Nall said to me, which was very uncharacteristic, well it wasn't my idea to buy the damn piece, it's too skinny anyway. But Steve, he doesn't sell anything. If you've got a million dollars, and I don't think you do, you ought to spend it and have a good time. Howard Hughes doesn't sell anything. I went to the bank and told Perry Thomas this story. Perry Thomas says, what a fetching idea. 
What I did not realize at the time was that Herb Jones, Cliff Jones, owed Perry Thomas some money and couldn't pay it. But because Perry was a friend and the bank had, had a long relationship, they weren't going to sue the guy. But if Cliff Jones he came into some money, he had signed the lease over to <laughs> yes. the bank that if they sold the property, if, the, if, if, Hugh, if, if, if Jones got the money for the parking lot, it was pledged to the bank. Perry heard me tell the story and said, we'll get the million. <laughs> this is a terrific idea. He picked up the phone, called Bill Gay, because he was used as banker, and said, listen, I got an idea. I think it's time. There's a guy who's made an offer on a piece of property that you own that's too small. Land next to Caesars. I think it's time you take that money. You can buy the parking lot at the landmark and save yourself some money. Bill Gay said, let me get back to you. And he sent a fax to the Bahamas. The fax went to the, to the Mormon guards, uh, Mormon secretaries. Hughes was in the Britannia Beach Hotel. Hughes read the fax and said, sell it. Called back Perry, Gay called back Perry Thomas. Five days later, Perry lent me the money, because I could pay it. Yeah. I, myself and another guy who had more money than me, who owned J&B Scotch, Abe Rosenberg, was one of my suppliers. We put up the million dollars. Perry Thomas took the million and paid himself off. <laughs> Everybody got something out of so the So the point of the story is circumstances luck. enabled you and luck and timing and all of that. So you take that piece of property and you say I'm sorry to you Caesars. Me that question. <laughs> no, <laughs> because it says something. So you take that piece of property and you say to Caesars, uh, or to the community there, I'm thinking about building a casino here, and just to show you, look, I've applied for a permit for a casino. And Caesar says he's serious. And they offer you what two and a half million or something? two and a quarter two and a quarter so you pocket about eight hundred thousand no, dollars I, I we made a million dollars my end of it was seven hundred thousand yeah. and abe's was three hundred so you then go to the golden nugget that's right go that's my investment or right, you go into okay. the golden nugget and you figure out that you buy a piece of the golden nugget and you arrive at the golden nugget and you find that it's not such a great place and after all and you appoint yourself or you get the board of directors to make you the ceo at 31. that's compressing the story but that's really what happened and I'm 30, just turned 31 years old, and I become the, uh, the chairman and the president. And then you bring in people like Sinatra and Martin. And that happened. That later. happened. That happened uh, 10 years later. And then right. you go to New Jersey. That happened five years later, and that's first we we straightened out the nugget and made more money. Then we went to Atlantic City, and in 1978, when gaming opened up in Atlantic City, we wanted to go there as a company, but the Valley Bank, Perry Thomas's bank, excuse me couldn't lend the kind of money you needed to build in Atlantic City. It took a hundred million or more. And we were a small company. We were worth five million. And it was a little crazy, but I met Milken. My best friend at the time was a guy named Stan Zacks. And I'm proud to say this lunatic is still my best friend. And he's Mike's cousin. Stanley's chairman of Zenith National Insurance Company. And he's, an, uh, he, he's Michael Milken's cousin. And Michael Milken says, I can sell some junk bonds. And Stanley goes to see Mike and says, you got to help Steve. He, my friend Steve Wynn has a golden nugget wants to build a hotel in Atlantic City. Milken says, let me meet him, bring him over. And I went over to meet him in the summer of 78 in Los Angeles, where Drexel, Burnham, Lambert had their offices. I had a broken leg. I was on crutches. And I met Milken, who was 30. I was 36. He was 32. I was 36. He asked me a few questions, like you are listens for about an hour about New Jersey, about the history of the Golden Nugget, and says, okay, I think it's probably time that we take on a gaming client. We'll raise the money for you to enter the market in Atlantic City. And he did. Raised $125 million. You then sell that. Uh, Place was a big hit. Made 80 or $90 million a year. And that put us in a different league with the cash flow. But you want to get out of Las Vegas. I mean, you want to get out of Atlantic City. Well, we were there for, until 86, and it was tough. The state was very antagonistic. A lot of regulations. Well, it was worse than that. There was an attitude that all the guys from Las Vegas, and anybody in gambling, was a hoodlum or a gangster, and that this was something that was shoved down our throat, but we're going to regulate these bums. And It was very intimidating, and, and unfortunately, it was very disrespectful. It's not that way now. But so you're going back in there? Yeah. Yeah, it's a whole different world today. It's matured, you know, 20 years changes a lot of stuff. And you're still in competition, though, with Donald Trump. And a lot of other guys there. Caesar's World is there, and they have the, they make more money than Donald Trump. And Hilton is there. Well, now they are. They just bought Valley. 
No, they're, 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 the Resorts International was there, Caesars was there, later on Trump came along and Bally bought the place from us and they, they were there with a great place, the Bally Park place. And competition was always very keen in Atlantic City. We were able to make more money than anybody else even though we were the smallest one. Because again, we weren't selling gambling. We were selling the sporting life. We had Frank Sinatra doing commercials about this is a great saloon to hang out at. And we whose idea was that? Your idea? Actually, it was. But I can't say it was an original idea, Charlie. I mean, Frank Sinatra had been identified with the high life, you know, the, the good times, the Rat Pack, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis, Peter Lawford. That when I was a kid at the Sands, I mean, I, I was picking up on some energy that maybe was right at the end of its day. But to me, the energy was real. And it turns out that Frank and Dean had a couple of really good seasons left in them. And Frank and Dean worked there together with Kenny Rogers and Lionel Richie, and Diana Ross. And the Golden Nugget captured everybody's fancy, not as a gambling hall in Atlantic City, as a place to hang out. All the Jews and all the Italians and everybody else from the East Coast used to like to come down to the Golden Nugget on weekends because it was fun to be there. They would see each other. It wasn't so much about craps or blackjack, it was about people. Thanks a lot, fellas. We'll get back to you. You'll we'll get, get back, back to us. us. Golden Nuggets, simply the best. You sell it because Bally wants to buy it. Some say you sold it to them because you wanted to stop Trump. No, if they you... wanted to stop Trump. Okay, That's so... why they made me the offer, which was a very generous because offer. Because he couldn't then buy. Yeah, they had a rule then. You couldn't have more than three casinos, and Bally had two. So if they bought the third one, Trump would have, to, would have to have more than three. You take any pleasure in that? No. I got pleasure in the 450 million cash. <laughs> All right, so I you, didn't know Trump. You then look west again. You come back to Las Vegas. So I, I want to make clear. I got a lot of pleasure out of the transaction, <laughs> but it had nothing to do with Donald. The pleasure, the pleasure was you, what, you made all that money. Sure. And it enabled you to come back and build in, what, 89, the Mirage. It, this all happened in late 86, and we were just bought the property from Hughes that the Mirage sits on. And the timing was perfect, because we could come back and concentrate on designing that hotel. And once again, Michael Milken steps in. Yes, yes. But by that time, the, Mir the Golden Nugget had a track record. And we raised the money for the Mirage quite easily. Mike, of course, did it. And because of Mike, we paid less for the money than anybody else. Someone once said, I think you, no milk and no Mirage. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. Tell me about this guy. Well, first of all, he could envision these things. You know, in every stage of your life, it seems to me that, you know, as, as aggressive as you think you are and as ambitious as you may be, you need to have your judgment and your confidence reinforced by others whom you respect. My father, Perry Thomas, when I was very young, Perry's faith in me was more important than my confidence in myself. I figured Perry Thomas believes in me, I, I, can, I must be okay, at least reasonably so. Mike Milken, like Perry Thomas, saw Las Vegas coming. Maybe more than I did. Frankly speaking, maybe more than me, Charlie. Michael saw gaming as an answer to a lot of different things in America. Extra leisure time, mm -hmm. the desire for integrated entertainment and food. Entertainment beverage. dollars in search of a place to deposit. He saw that all and talked about it in great detail uh, to me. And when I said, we've got this property, because I always wanted to have a big strip hotel. I wanted to take a crack at Caesars and the Sands. I wanted to be another one of the, 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 the road marks in that progression. See, now that's interesting. What is it you want to be? And what did you want to be then, and what do you want to be now? And you want to grow up? Yeah. <laughs> when, you, yeah, yeah. when you get there. What is it? I have to come on this program to find out. <laughs> uh, I know what I get a thrill out of. I've always loved the idea of making places where people go, wow, that are wonderful. I'm a true romantic in the literary sense, in the sense that it's wonderful to build a world that as George S. Kaufman say, the, the way God would if he had money. <laughs> Remember that old crack yeah. that George S. Kaufman made? I, I find, when I was a kid growing up in Florida, Elaine and I, our parents, remember I said our dads played gin? They did it at a place called the Fauna Blue, and there was a guy named Ben Novak that built this place. And the Fauna Blue was a magnificent environment, and everybody from around the world wanted to be in it. And I thought, how wonderful it is to make your own world. 
where everybody has fun. In so guys in your pantheon, Ben Novak, Jay Sarno. That's the group. Bill <laughs> Harrah. Yep. Because these guys did what? They created places that were better than the outside world. Every, like, remember Joel, remember, remember Joel Gray in the opening scene of Cabaret? Welcome in Bienvenue. Welcome in here. Everyone is beautiful. The band is beautiful. That's the way I think of it. In here, everything is beautiful. The paintings are beautiful. The volcano is beautiful. You come here, you have a good time, and you can forget your problems. I, I know when I go there that it has that effect on me even today. I like doing that. That strikes me as enough fun for any adult male to want to have, or female. I think that's a good life. When you walk through that casino, what do you feel? Any one of them. I find the casino a very intense place. My moments in the hotel that give me the greatest personal satisfaction are when I'm walking around the fringes, the more non-casino. The villas are. and the places the that... The dolphins, the front, the atriums, the things that, that really bring the people. The casino is like the cash register, but it's the non-casino stuff that's the hook. That's the hook. And we get well, a how, Why is that the hook? I mean, here's, here's what I don't understand. They come here because they like to gamble. But, Charlie, if that was it, they don't have to come here anymore. If that was it, then the spread of gambling would have proved once and for all that Las Vegas was nothing more than a gambling town. So they come here because they want to watch Sacred and Roy. They, they come want for to, the party. They come for the party. They come for the I think they always came for the party. I don't think they came for the gambling. Because it's a way to get away from whatever is the routine of your life and, and go to somewhere see where you can't see lights anywhere all else. night and special and different. And, it's like Disneyland. And you see Disney. Walt Disney is what for you? I think he was a guy that had the same kind of fascination, the same kind of obsession with the things I mentioned a moment ago. Walt Disney had, of course, a really idyllic view of the world, played with electric trains and then bigger model trains, which is how Disneyland got started, his trains. And Walt Disney wanted to make fantasy come to reality. I think that we're doing the same thing. Walt Disney once said, I'm going to give every American a chance to let his imagination go wild. Right. What's better than that? To me, if you've got the insight, if you've got the access to talent, if you've got the courage to see it through, and you can make the things that people, the, the, the wonderful images that live in people's imagination come to life. I mean, everybody has a view of Europe, of the good old days of Cary Grant and Grace Kelly racing down the old route in, from Monte Carlo to, uh, to Cap Ferrat. Everybody has this view of the Riviera. Now, when you go to the Riviera this summer, you may find that reality and your fantasies don't mesh. So, yeah. when but you at, at Bellagio, my new hotel, they will. When you talk about this in the 80s, do you see a direct link to your father and the kind of person he was and what he liked in life and where you are today and the role you're playing? My dad never had the chance to deal with these elements in his life. But my father's aspirations to be a player. His bingo halls were immaculate, they were clean, the parties that he would, he always had theme parties every week for his guests, for the bingo ladies. That's why they love coming there. He said, Steve, they don't care about winning. They care about the activity of being here. You told a story about once that some customer, that some employee said something negative about a customer and you watched your father get angry and you ever seen him? For 10 minutes. For 10 minutes. Half hour maybe. A, a guy who was working for us in Maryland, it happened at the, at the bingo in Maryland where I worked when I was a student, made a crack and called the customer a sucker. A woman, when she walked away, my, my, Mike was infuriated. He was offended. He said, what, what right do you have to say a thing like that? And because my father taught me this too, because he had a story. That person did us the courtesy of coming here buy something for us. And that's where her livelihood came from. And that's where it is. Let me talk about some personal things. Um, boy, you have been through everything. You had a daughter kidnapped. Yeah. You had to pay ransom. A thing you wouldn't want to visit on your worst enemy. It's not like TV. Real terror is not like television. The, you, know, you know, ever since you're a child, every person talks to themselves in a certain voice, no matter how old you are, 
that voice never changes since you're a kid? When you're hysterical inside, the voice goes too fast. Parts of your body shake. It's hard to control your breathing when you're alone. Thoughts scream through your head at a, at a terrible speed. And you say, whoa, stop, hold it. And, and the cold, a kidnapping is a cold-blooded event in the sense that for a moment, for some horrible period of time, you are being told by someone that they're going to execute someone who you cherish. And that your behavior, your conduct, will determine the outcome of an, of an execution. This notion may sound terrible to hear me say it, but to live it is, is really a subject that is not worth talking about because I, I will never communicate as long as I ever try, unless I'm talking to some poor misbegotten creature like myself who's been through it. And listen, we were lucky. Kevin was back the same night. There are people, but that's not true. But while it's going on, you don't know. And listen, I'll tell you how bad it was, Charlie. I wouldn't wish it on the guy that did it. And I'm plenty hot at him. I would love to have broken his nose, you know. Not a capital offense, he didn't hurt her. But it was the worst, absolutely the most inexplicable terror I've ever felt, so. You and Elaine got a divorce. Hmm. An unsuccessful divorce. And it didn't work out. No, nah, the, the divorce didn't work. So, but you never moved out of the house. Why, no. when you got a divorce, wouldn't you move out of the house? For five years, we lived together, like young kids do. Money thing, the estate, all that was done, cut yeah. and dry. She so you said, let's money. get all this stuff passed. We this. had absolutely nothing holding us together. Except. And the question was, would you stay? And the thought never entered my mind for one second not to. And then finally, after five years, we got remarried in the same place on the same day that we did the first time at the Waldorf on June 29th. We were divorced between tw year 23 to year 28. Now it's year 33. And when people say, how long have you been married? We say, met or gross. <laughs> yeah, we had a divorce that didn't work out. But it was an interesting experience. It, it's probably a good idea to dissolve the contract every 20 years or so just to see if it's cool. You got everything and even the marriage for the second time, all the money, and then uh, the health issue. Or you mean my eyes? Your eyes. Well, I was born with it. Congenital. Yeah, it's a genetic thing, retinitis pigmentosa. And, uh, and you know, a, a tough piece of information to get the first day you find out. Someone says, look, at your, your vision is in doubt. You're going to uh, slowly but surely lose your eyesight. And you say, well, how slowly and how surely? And, and they say, we don't know for sure. There's a chance you may never actually not be able to see but you are going to be handicapped as time goes by. There are things you won't be able to do, like drive a car or see in the dark. That's what happens. When it's you're worse young. in the dark, at night. It, you totally can't see in the dark. It's that part of your eye that involves the, the evening in, the, in dim light. That goes when you're, when you're a teenager, really. I found out about this when I was 29. I was very lucky. I had a little, very good eyesight as a kid, so that I started with a lot, sort of like a reserve. Yeah. So I still am able to live a fairly normal life. I mean, I don't drive a car, and I can't run around in the dark. I have to grab a hold of somebody if I'm in a theater or someplace like that or a, or a, or a lounge somewhere. But I don't take it personally. You know, uh, you could take a handicap of any kind, and as you get to be our age, sooner or later some doctor's going to tell you something you don't like, and you could decide right then and there that, oh, God, the anticipated horror of it is so awful that I might as well end my life on the, on the spot. But you never say to yourself, God, it, this, this is God's revenge because life has been so good because I've had opportunities that few men have had and I've got such a great life and this is God's, God's revenge. revenge. I am absolutely convinced as we sit here tonight that he's on my side. <laughs> if there's ever been, a, if there's, if there's ever been one person idiot I have had been, a reason. if there's ever been a sucker that, because somebody is on my side, I'll tell yeah. you. Does it make you angry, though, if any part of you to say, I mean... Well, if, if you have a, a handicap, right, whether you can't see or you can't walk right, or there are times when it, it infuriates me. 
I can't find something that's right, right in front of me. Right. But look, it's an inconvenience. And the, the measure of my health, my mental health, is my ability to treat it as such, to minimize it, not to deny it. I mean, but, Charlie, you and I have been together, and I say, it's dark. I grab your shoulder. Right. I don't feel embarrassed about that. It's not my fault. Listen, there's a lot of things I can't do besides see in the dark. I can't, I can't shoot a basket like Michael Jordan. I can't jump as high as Mikhail Baryshnikov, and I can't carry a tune. But there are a lot of things I can do, and what I do in life is I focus on the things I can do. Is there anything that you very much want that you don't have in terms of the kind of life you've lived? I'm not the kind of person that dwells on the things that I can't do except carry a tune. I'm part of the singing impaired. Mm. There are things that I would love to see in my lifetime, or I'd like to know, I'd like to see my children have the kind of a life that Elaine and I have had. But what father wouldn't? I would like to see the, the people that have grown up with me at my company experience the kind of personal satisfaction that comes with stretching and trying great, great, trying big projects. There are an awful lot of them now whose whole life and identity are, are linked to these projects. And these men and women are headed for some great victories, or if we're wrong, some very difficult moments. I, w I will get more pleasure out of having a front row seat to that process because I've already had my moments in this. Yeah. And financially, I'm in good shape. But there's a whole generation of people at the Mirage companies that are testing themselves. And, and, and it's a very egotistical thing to say, but being part of creating those kinds of opportunities, the, the, the human ones, that's a very, very heady kind of thing. Why do you think you've been this successful, A, and B? Why do you think Fortune Magazine, when they pulled all these CEOs, called Mirage the second most admired company, second to Coca-Cola, which has the world's greatest brand name. Frankly, I think they made a mistake. I, I honestly thought they were pulling my, our leg. I, I mean, is a guiding I philosophy that you think has made a difference? I, which never, is, I never dreamt that anything like that would happen, which is one of the reasons why it's been so overwhelmingly delicious. I never dreamt that anything like that would happen, Charlie. And when asked by Fortune, what do you think, what do you attribute it to, there can only be one answer. It sure as hell ain't the slot machines. They're everywhere, in Las Vegas and every place else these days. Uh, we've been supporting, the, we, we, we're, we're in supporting these outfits that want to stop the spread of gaming. But You mean you support Tom Gray or whatever his name is? I call him on the phone occasionally to tease him. I'd give him a donation if, 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 it, if it wouldn't destroy the credibility of his group. But I, when, when Detroit passed a law, I said, Tom, you're slipping. <laughs> Let's go. Get out there. All right, I got a, not much time. And I got to get to some other things. One is is this notion of 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 this city uh, and this culture uh, and the higher. What's the what's the most? Just out of curiosity, somebody wants to know this. What's the most money ever lost uh, at one of your casinos by one person? Yeah, seventy. Seventy million. Million in a year? No. In a no. night? No. In Over. a week? No, three years. In three years? Yeah. Seventy million dollars? Yep. An American or someone outside of our shores? No, someone from another country. Who had seventy million dollars to spare? At the time. <laughs> <laughs> Strange and remarkable. Now, were story. you there? Were you? Were I was. You, I was there for many. It, yeah. it, it, it involved many, many sessions. Many weekends. Playing what game? Baccarat. Is that right? What? Baccarat. Do you gamble? I occasionally. For the fun of it? or Yeah, yeah. craps. Yeah, gambling's fun. In moderation. Yeah. Sure, it's great well, Bill fun. Bill Sapphire is de on your, oh, not on your case, but he's on a case of gambling. Yes. And you say to him, look, my father was a gambler, I guess you would say. A problem gambler. A problem gambler. And I know what you're talking about. I sure do. But I believe in the business I'm in. I know exactly what I'm talking about. This is a subject that I've spent my life on. I know about problem gaming. I was one of the first... Uh, Board of Trustee members of the uh, National Association for Pathological and Compulsive yeah. Gambling in Washington. It's a subject with which I am familiar. It's my life's work. 
Bill Sapphire is a wonderful author, and I've enjoyed him many times. On this subject, he is strident and, unfortunately, not well informed. Someday, he's going to make it his business. He believes that gambling has a pernicious effect. Well, he came to the, regardless of the facts, he doesn't really understand the business. And someday, he'll take a more, he'll take a more, a more intellectual and a more scholastic approach to this, and he'll learn the whole story. Where do you think it spreads to, this business of gaming? I mean, there are certain communities that have turned it down. Mm -hmm. You wanted to go certain places, and you can't go there. A few places should have turned it down that didn't. Like? It, it, this, it, the installation of big integrated gaming facilities, the good news and the bad news is they draw a big crowd, they create a lot of jobs, they pay a healthy tax. But What's the they, bad news? they play hell with the infrastructure. They change the neighborhood. You can't put Walt Disney World in the average town and expect that town ever to be the same again. Big things, you know, when you hit a, a town Ask with all those people around Orlando. That's right. Orlando's never going to be the same again. Yeah, right. You, you put, it's great. Everybody talks about how wonderful it is to put a hundred or two hundred million dollar payroll into a city. Every, everybody does good. But the fact of the matter is, these kinds of things change a community. I think the best thing for communities is first of all to have an idea of who they are and what they want and where they ought to go. That's the job of political leadership. And once they do that, if creating a tourist industry is on their agenda, and that's the best thing for them, then probably this subject of casino resorts has something to offer. But just to think of casinos just for the taxes or just for this or that has led to a lot of short-term confusion, I think. You once made a run at MCA. I did not. Actually you, did you it. accumulate 4% of it? I bought 5% of the company for Four. investment purposes and called up when I had 3% and told Lou Wasserman it was an investment. I had no intention of doing it. He didn't go. look at it that way, did he? He said to me through, Lou, to, through uh, Felix Rowerton, at 4.9, we love you. At 5, it's enemy action. I said, thank you very much, and I never went past 4.9. And you liquidated your investment and, and made $10, $11 million. When the stock went up from 39 to 46, I sold it. Yeah. I should Does have kept that it suggest, went much higher. Did that suggest that at some point you thought, man, the natural extension of what I'm doing is to go into the motion picture business, to go into allied entertainment businesses? In the case of MCA, I wasn't thinking that. You were thinking just of investment? There was a time when I thought it'd be wonderful to see if we could take a big position at Disney because of my childhood fascination with Walt Disney. I learned about MCA because Milken gave me three companies to read about, ABC, MCA, and Disney, for comparison. The American Broadcasting Company, Walt Disney, Disney Corporation. And I read these big studies on each yeah. of the companies that have been done by investment banking firms like you know, Wertheimer, Morgan Stanley, and when I read I lost my interest in Disney, because I saw it was a business and it wasn't what I thought anymore. ABC was not something that interests me, but the f balance sheet and the asset value of MCA so captured my attention that I made the investment of $100 million with the company's money. And you backed off finally because you knew Wasserman said it'll be war and we don't want to do this. Well, if I, I asked Wasserman permission through a friend of mine, Merv Adelson, would it be okay if we bought 10%? And through Felix Rowerton, the answer 4. came back at okay. 4.9, you're fine, Steve. <laughs> at 5, we're not happy. So I couldn't do it. And I didn't want to be a pain in the neck, and we weren't in that business, and I stopped. Okay. Do you want to own other businesses outside of the core businesses you're in? No. None? No. Not Hollywood, not Wall no. Street, not... It's too late. Detroit, we, too late. We do chicken. <laughs> we do chicken. <laughs> Every time somebody diversifies, you they know. fall right under patootie. I'm not interested. Yeah. I'm, I'm, my business is tough enough. Well, I won't get aggravated with someone else's So business. just be the what? Be the best? That would be good. I'd like to be the best at what we do. You know, everybody in my company is in love with our image as a pursuit of excellence game. And nobody in the company, and I mean this from top to bottom, is willing to give that up. Everybody likes the idea that the Golden Nugget, Treasure Island, Mirage are immaculate, they're fanciful, and they're lovely. And if we can grow and keep that image, then we'll keep building hotels. That's it. Pleasure to have you on the broadcast. Oh, thanks, Charlie. It's fun to have you here in town. Thanks, man. Okay. See you. We thank you for joining us. We have been in Las Vegas. We'll be here until tomorrow. My thanks especially to the people at KLVX Channel 10 in Las Vegas. Good night. We'll see you back in New York.
tomorrow. Charlie Rose is made possible by a grant from USA Networks as part of our continuing commitment to innovative television. Through USA Network and the Sci-Fi Channel, we provide original entertainment to America and the world. Charlie Rose is also made possible by these funders. To order Charlie Rose program transcripts and video cassettes, call 1-800-ALL-NEWS or write to the address on your screen. Please indicate show date and guest. This is PBS. Local support for Charlie Rose is made possible in part by a grant from Mirage Resorts Incorporated, developers of the Golden Nugget and Mirage in Las Vegas and the Golden Nugget in Laughlin. Mirage Resorts Incorporated is pleased to support TV worth watching.